everyone for their flexibility with being virtual this morning. Um, I'm sorry, Evan and Jackie, that we don't get to see you guys in person, um, but I'm thrilled we still get to do this. Um, so just a quick reminder, uh, next week um, we're canceling Grand Rounds for ACC, so I hope to see many of you there. And again, thanks to those that are um, covering the services uh, here in Connecticut. Um, and without further ado, I will now uh, hand things over to Sarah and she will introduce um, our two awesome fellows and we'll kick this great debate off. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks, Catherine. Um, so I have the distinct honor of introducing um, our these two stellar fellows and then also um, moderating the Q&A afterwards. So um, I'm going to do one introduction at a time and then we're going to, so we're going to start with um, Jackie. So um, just she no, she needs no introduction, but um, for for the sake of our our format, uh, so Dr. Jacqueline Pires is uh, a, a excuse me Pires is a clinical fellow at Yale School of Medicine, a section of cardiovascular medicine. She completed her residency training at the Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine and earned her medical degree at University of Massachusetts Medical School. And, you know, Jackie is, is well known in our section as being a wonderful advocate for both individual patients and communities. And so we're really excited to hear her talk today and present her side um, of this debate, which um, I, I think just to sort of briefly introduce it, but I'm going to let her take the reins. The, the question is, you know, when, when we when we encounter patients with a very small degree of incidental coronary calcification or non-calcified plaque on, on imaging, when they don't have clear symptoms of coronary disease, there's no evidence of obstruction, and they don't have other risk factors that we traditionally associate with adverse cardiovascular events, uh, events like hypertension or hyperlipidemia, how do we best approach them? So Jackie is going to argue one side, and then we're going to hear from Evan argue the other side. So Jackie, take it away. Good morning, Dr. Hull. Thank you for those lovely comments. I'm going to share my screen because Evan and I decided that, hold on, maybe let's stop the share. So we decided that we wanted to start this morning with, with asking all of you that are present today um, to answer a question. So if I can find my, here we go. Dr. Miller is probably laughing at me because he knows that technology is hard for me. So let's see. So trying to share a portion of my screen um, so we can get started with the question that we designed for, for you. Oops. I'm almost there. Okay, here we go. Can everyone see my screen and um, see either the QR code that you can take a picture of or um, the um, name and number to text? It's right. perfect, Jackie, thank you. Thank you, I'm glad there's someone here to help. So I wanted to start with the question because like Dr. Hull mentioned, we, we are increasingly seeing numbers of patients that accidentally or incidentally had coronary artery findings. So if you can take a moment to read the question and then answer it, Evan will um, share his screen and post the results. So the answer should be A, B, C, or D. I think the uh, the the instructions say send one, two, or three, or four if you text, but it should be A, B, C, or D. Just correcting that. Evan, the question is so long, give them two minutes. Of course. I can see we already have uh, 11 answers, 13. I'm gonna share the, the answers in a minute. 
Stand and ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie, do you want me to share my screen with the answers or? Yeah, I think I think if, if we have enough answers, we can move on. Yep. So I may have to stop your uh, sharing for a moment. Oh, no. Go ahead. <laughs> so let me just show that there is. Uh, so we've had, uh, let me see how many answers so far. We've had 19 answers so far. And as you can see, not everyone agrees. Um, and uh, two thirds of uh, the people who responded would prescribe a statin alone for this uh, for this patient, a uh, 52 year old woman with not many risk factors and some minimal but present coronary atherosclerosis. But almost, well, that just changed now. <laughs> uh, I, I was gonna say one in three, but one in four people would also prescribe, prescribe aspirin therapy uh, for this patient. And one in 10 will probably uh, just not prescribe any pharmacotherapy to begin with. So with that, I'm going to pass the microphone back to Jackie to start her presentation. So Jackie, I think you can take over the screen sharing. Okay, that was easy. All right, good morning, everyone. I think I already said that. Thank you for tuning in this morning to give Evan and I your undivided attention over the next 45 minutes as we take you on a journey across the past two decades on the research and innovation of non-invasive coronary artery assessment. Here's the truth. I did not make these images or figures up. I found them online. I attempted to remove as much as I could the names of the programs or their geographical locations. Um, the truth is, this case, though fictional and created for the purposes of today's Grand Rounds, does not sit in a silo. We are seeing increasing numbers of patients who are presenting with incidental findings of coronary artery calcifications. And unfortunately, a good thing has turned sour as these tools are being used out of the realms of data or guidelines. The truth is all of us will be faced with increasing numbers of asymptomatic individuals who are now incidentally or accidentally diagnosed with imaging-based atherosclerosis. So when this happens, what, what do you do? And what do I do in my own clinical practice? Well, in the next 18 minutes, I'm going to show you what lack of data there is. I'm going to prove to you that it would be erroneous and non-data driven to treat this patient as secondary prevention as my opponent will argue for. We're going to calculate her risk together. So you and I are going to go through the pool cohort equations and the MISA calculator, and then figure out where that data comes from to begin with. We're going to examine whether calcium and presence of plaque is the whole story for the progression of coronary artery disease. So Evan's going to argue with you that this patient now has imaging diagnosed atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Oops, and, and as such, he, he wants to treat this patient or he's going to argue for the treatment of secondary prevention. In fact, two thirds of you argued that you would treat this patient with statins. And so we know that the cornerstone of secondary prevention is antiplatelets, antithrombotic agents, as well as high intensity statins. I was afraid I was going to lose to him. So I went on a hunt to find the statin trial that would, would have included this patient therefore allowing me to externally validate their findings on this particular patient. So I combed through the inclusion criteria of every single statin trial. I went through them in the way that you're seeing and crossed them out. So in the 4S trial, the first of the statin trials, patients had prior MI, so this patient wouldn't fit. In HPS, patients had either prior MI or ADD, or they were diabetic, she wouldn't fit. And prove it, patients had ACS within 24 hours before they were randomized to pravastatin or torvastatin. She wouldn't fit. And treating to new targets, better known as the TNT trial, patients had symptomatic coronary artery disease. Wouldn't fit. In the SPARKLE trial, patients had known ASCVD with prior stroke within six months of trial enrollment. Okay? So at this point, I've gone over some of the major secondary prevention trials. What about primary prevention trials? In CARDS? which unlike the other trials was a primary prevention trial, patients had diabetes and at least one other risk factor, she wouldn't fit. 
In the ASCOT trial, patients had diabetes and other cardiovascular risk factors. Okay. What about, you know, in the primary prevention guidelines, we always talk about the, the idea of patients having a 7.5% risk of 10-year ASCVD. Well, that's the AF, the AFCAPS trial, one of the true primary prevention trials. Patients had neither diabetes nor CED equivalents, but she didn't meet criteria or would not meet criteria because if you, if you remember, her LDL was 92. And in that trial, the baseline LDL was 150. And I think you can get the point, and I'm not going to go over all of them, but this patient would not meet inclusion criteria for the data that we now have available. I was going to talk about aspirin last to really put the dagger in, but let's go with, with the secondary prevention argument just for a second. So secondary prevention consists of antiplatelets and high-intensity statins. And aspirin has been the cornerstone of the antiplatelet, antithrombotic management of patients with ASCVD for greater than three decades. And clinical practice guidelines recommend long-term aspirin therapy for the secondary prevention treatment of patients with established ASCVD. But 2018 was a very bad year for aspirin. We, for decades, extrapolated the risk of secondary prevention aspirin to the primary prevention world. And many patients were taking aspirin, whether they were diabetic whether they were older, and we assumed, given that CAD is a disease of age, that these patients would have ASCVD sooner rather than later as they age. And we, what we realized in 2018 was that we were wrong and that extrapolation of data did not work, and we were causing more harm than we were causing good. In fact, we realized we were causing so much harm that we changed the guidelines. We changed the primary prevention guidelines in 2019 to suggest that aspirin was harmful. And where there is a to be recommendation, it's a little bit sort of hedging patients who are at higher risk of ASCVD, but not at increased risk of bleeding. What does that mean? And how do you apply that in everyday practice? I'm not sure that I figured that out yet, but these are the guidelines. And so if Evan is squarely wrong, which hopefully I've proven that he is and he will be, so bear with me on the primary prevention argument. So that's what I'm left with for this patient. And so my job is to showcase the data on primary prevention and let you come away with your own take on the evidence. So these are the 2018 um, lipid guidelines, which they then apply to the 2018, 2019 primary prevention guidelines. So the US guidelines recommend moderate intensity statins according to baseline risk. And the only criteria for then intensifying to high intensity would be in the setting of ACS, history of ASCVD, or patients that have very high risk by risk enhancers. So there are certain patients, and, and we know that there are certain patients where the use of statin is non-arguable. Those patients do not need further risk assessment. So these are your these, these green class one boxes up here, that your diabetic patients once they turn 40, and your folks with an LDL of greater than 190, as well as an ASCVD uh, risk score of greater than 50. But if you notice, the primary prevention guidelines don't talk about targets. Instead, what they focus on is the idea of reducing to a certain extent. And so our, our targets, per se, for primary prevention in 2018 became more of a moderate or high intensity. There are certain small populations, if you read the fine print in the 2018 guidelines, where they, they still do meet target criteria in primary prevention. Those are patients with, the guidelines call them heterozygous for familial hypercholesterolemia. I'm labeling them as severe hypercholesterolemia. And there's a two-way recommendation as well for folks with an ASCVD risk of greater than seven and a half percent and chronic inflammatory diseases. If you go back to our patient, her risk was 4.8. So she was a bit borderline. And so let's say, let's go with Evan's argument of secondary prevention. So this, these are our own American 2018 guidelines uh, for, for secondary prevention. And what the, what the American guidelines do is they classify ASCVD patients, either not at very high risk, so folks with stable CAD or very high risk. And in very high risk, the guidelines are talking about people with ASCVD, often multiple events, and then in addition to that, having high risk conditions. And I know we often talk about the idea of an LDL target of less than 70, but when you go look at the data and when you look at our own guidelines, in reality, the guidelines actually say, look, if you have not at very high risk ACVD, 
place these patients on a moderate intensity statin and a two-week recommendation on whether they really need that target of less than 70. Often though, what we're doing clinically and in practice is we're applying these very high-risk ASCVD scores or, or, or recommendations and sort of saying, if you've had ASCVD, the American population is older, it's more obese, we're unhealthier, so we'll meet those targets. And so, you know, you're probably saying, okay, well, you know, let's say the patient gets a seven, gets a statin, and okay, maybe I will target because I'm concerned about the calcium that I saw on her on her scan. Well, okay, where it gets tricky is when we start looking looking over to our European colleagues because maybe less than seventy is not so bad. It's not that aggressive. Well, the, our European colleagues define ASCVD. Well, they don't define ASCVD differently. So by definition, they define ASCVD in the way that we do. Where they stray from, from our recommendations is the idea of very high risk and the idea of they even have an extreme risk. And so interestingly, they actually say folks that have what they call unequivocal on imaging findings, which they label as two or more coronary arteries or epicardial coronary arteries with a greater than 50% stenosis, they actually label that as ASCVD with or without symptoms. And they go on and they say, these folks should have an LDL of less than 55. And folks um, for at extremely high risk, which for them is labeled as people that have had two or more events in the past year, they get an LDL score that, or, or target intended target of less than 40. Let's take a step back. Here's what we do know. We know that gains in ASCVD risk reduction diminish as LDL cholesterol levels fall to very low levels. The reason is the curvilinear or log linear relationship between LDL and ASCVD risk. And while the aggressive LDL cutoff by our European friends it can probably be justified from a pathogenesis or theoretical grounds with on the basis of the general concept that lower is better for LDL. I will say, based on my review of the literature, that this lags rigorous testing. It lacks efficacy by randomized control trials, and it, lasts, it lacks cost-effectiveness analysis. So we go back to the primary prevention guidelines, because I personally would not treat this patient to an LDL cutoff of less than 55 based on what I found in the literature. So if we go back and we say, okay, well, her risk was borderline. She was 4.8. And so let's move her over here to this box to make those of us that get nervous around coronary artery calcifications a bit happier. Well, this would place her in the borderline risk bucket. And so but, but what does that mean? So I, when I first started looking at the guidelines to prepare for this talk, I started to say, well, what is, the, what is this 5%? What's, what is seven and a half? What does the risk mean? Where did that come from? Well, it came from the pool cohort, pool cohort equations. So in the US, the PCEs are the guideline recommended atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk estimator. That's a mouthful, but what I can tell you is that the PCEs were first introduced in the 2013 cholesterol guidelines, and they were ultimately derived from five U.S.-based cohorts of enrolled volunteers, which at the time, which was around the mid-90s, seemed to be racially and geographically diverse. And since then, the pool cohort equations have been found to overestimate cardiovascular risk. And it was not just in women, it was not just in minorities. We saw risk overestimation in the physician's health study. We saw risk estimation in the women's health study, and we saw it in the women's health initiative and observational cohort. So in 2018, they recalibrated the pool cohort equation, but it's still shown to be a risk as overestimator. And the theory behind that, the theory of, you know, why did this risk assessor that the guidelines implemented in 2013 and have continued to use or recommend that we use, why, why is that overestimating the risk of um, atherosclerotic disease? The theory is that it, the, the, patient, the participants were enrolled between 1968 and 1990. And, and despite what we're seeing in the developing world, unfortunately, in the developed world, which is, I don't like those terms, but in the US and in 
and in, in Europe, we're seeing that cardiovascular event rates have declined, despite the fact that heart disease is still the number one killer in the US, it has declined over the past 45 years. So that may help explain the overestimation of risk. Why am I bringing this up? What I'm trying to get across here is at baseline, we are already overestimating risk for patients. And when you start compounding incidental imaging findings, how many people in the population will we expose to unnecessary treatments? And also the other part, the other side of the coin is that we're not, we're not even doing a good enough job with our secondary prevention people. Time and time and time again, implementation data says that in the US, folks that need statins in the secondary prevention arm, we're meeting about 60% of that target. So now we expose another swath of the population. So if we go back here, there are 138 million Americans between the age of 40 and 75. So that the point I'm trying to get across is overestimation of risk compounded by outside of data use of imaging findings. And so I know our patient didn't get a CAC score, but because there's a lot more data behind CAC, um, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time here to go over that data, to go over what we know so far, and to do the MISA calculation with you. So um, I think it was really, you know, the, the CAC consortium has made a lot of their fame really on the heels or the realm of this, this fear that we all have of either underestimating the risk or overestimating the risk in our patient population. And so CAC is thought to estimate the burden of coronary artery calcifi calcified atherosclerosis. I want to be very clear that you're only looking at the burden of calcification. It does not get a, a mixed plaque. And so because it does a non-invasive assessment of the coronary arteries, it's, it's been seen as a method for further risk stratification in the primary prevention setting. And just quickly, for those of us that are not familiar, though I, I'm not sure that there's anybody in this audience who's not familiar, but the quantification unit is the Agatston unit, which is a product of area and density of calculation or calcification. And then the total CAX is computed by summing the scores of all calcified lesions. And you can express that, or it is expressed when we get the reports as a percentile adjusted for sex and race. That sounds pretty reasonable. Uh, the results can range from zero, meaning that there was no calcium seen, to thousands of Agatston units. The, the buy or the sell-in is that it's not invasive. There's no contrast use, and it's fairly low radiation. And when I was looking at the literature, it seems like when CAC first started coming onto the scene, uh, they were quoting about one millisievert of, of radiation received per session. But but there, there's actually recent data that they're, they're, they're even able to get that down to about 0.5. And if you're not used to, well, what is one millisievert? How do I place that in day-to-day -day context? It's about one third of the average annual exposure that we all get from natural sources just by, by being in the world. So, you know, what's the data behind CAC? There's, at first I had like 50 slides with the PAC trial and and um, the CSC consortium, some of their, their retrospective analysis, but let's just focus on MISA. So the MISA cohort, which began enrollment in 2000, had the mission of naturally following and observing the characteristics that lead to progression of what they deem as subclinical cardiovascular disease, which they're describing as either having risk factors or CAC, um, to clinical cardiovascular disease. And the, the MISA came right about in the early 2000s, right on the heels of some other studies that had looked at CAC only in Caucasian populations. So they also were interested in assessing the ethnic age and sex difference components in, in coronary artery calcification. So they recruited these patients across the US. I think it was New York City, Baltimore, LA, North Carolina. Ideally, they're, they're selling you on the fact that these cities are very diverse. And so we're getting a very diverse cohort, which they, they did end up achieving. Um, they calculated these, these participants' cardiovascular risk, and then they these patients underwent CAC scanning. And this was followed by eight years of re-examination of risk measurements and CAC progression, about every 12 to 24 months. So I'll show you the, uh, the major figure in their flashy 2008 New England Journal paper. So these are unadjusted Kaplan-Meier cumulative event curves for coronary events amongst participants that either, that had four different uh, grades of CAC. So they either had a CAC of zero, one to 100, one to one to 300, and greater than 300, which I know makes most of us nervous. Panel A shows the rates for major coronary events, which they defined as MI or death from coronary heart disease. Panel B shows the rates for any coronary event, 
And the difference among all curves are, are statistically significant. This looks impressive, right? So folks that had a CAC of greater than 300, boy, these lines really are separate from CAC of zero. I just wanna put a bug in your ear. MISA had approximately 7,000 patients. A total of 162 participants had coronary events, roughly about 2%. Keep that number in mind. So let, let's use the MISA calculator. So what I did is I sat down and I said, okay, well, this patient is fictional, but I would be doing this in clinic if I see a patient that I want to better understand the risk. So I did this. I inputted her risk. And using a decade and a half of the using a decade and a half of data, the MISA group has generated the MISA calculator, which is a risk assessment tool that integrates into the traditional cardiovascular risk factors, coronary the coronary artery calcium score. So I inputted all of our patients' data, and I know she didn't get a CAC, but let's say that she had a CAC of ten. Her risk would go from two point one percent to two point eight. Okay, well, I think most of us wouldn't necessarily worry about a CAC of 10. And you can see, you can see that the data shows her risk increases, but really not truly by that much. And would you justify statins? And in fact, would you justify Evan's argument of statins with the secondary prevention mentality? Let's say her CAC is 100. Okay, her risk at baseline without having any information about her coronaries would be 2.1%. We said that already. And if her CAC was 100, it would go to 5.1%. So that's the 10-year risk, okay? What if it's 1,000? What if her CAC was 1,000? Well, her risk would go again from 2.1% down here to 9.3%. And I'm by no means just, you know, minimizing the idea that the 10-year risk of, of coronary heart disease would be 10%. But... But focus on the other side of the coin. That means that in 10 years, 90 people don't have events with her same risk factors. 10 do, but 90 people don't, okay? So I, I, I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna go over the benefit of CAC. Um, you know, what I was gonna say is we all agree that CAC scoring is vital to up or down classifying. I'm not disagreeing that it's a useful tool, but it's a tool. And within our guidelines, it's a tool within the primary prevention realm. And ultimately, I want to end in the last couple of slides by saying, well, you're probably thinking, okay, so what? So what? She had this, she had this coronary CTA for, for appropriate or inappropriate reasons. And now we know she has disease. So what do we do with that? Here's what I have to say about that is that we have 50, about 50 years, the first paper I found was from the 70s. We have 50 years of coronary pathological and histo histological data. And what we know about events, and these are, as you can see, non-obstructive and obstructive thrombi, but what you can see from the histological data is that we, we are, we're very sure that there's a certain phenotype to plaque that ruptures or erodes. Not all plaque ruptures or erodes. In fact, we, we know this so well, and, and it becomes test, testing fodder, right? Like we know that plaque at greatest risk of rupture are usually composed of large necrotic cores covered by thin layers of fibrous cap. And we have autopsy data that shows us that on average, um, people, young people that died of unnatural causes with a mean age of 36, greater than 80% already have atherosclerosis. So what I have to say about knowing about the coronary artery calcium presence or plaque in general is that the presence of atherosclerosis alone is not enough for the progression of CAD. It's not enough. For the development of CAD, we have certain prerequisite requirements. And we all remember this figure, but we need a constellation of genetic and environmental factors for the successful progression to coronary artery disease. Furthermore, we need a specific type of plaque, a secret special sauce that we cannot get with CTAs and we cannot get with CAC. In other words, all plaque is not created equal and we should treat each individual patient according to such. And then you say, okay, well, all plaque is different. There's mixed plaque and calcified plaque. Well, what about calcium? What if there's a lot of calcium? 
Well, this is from 2017. There was a Dutch cohort of men, average age 45. They had previously been enrolled in the Mark study. They have no coronary artery disease. These were elite athletes. They sought medical advice for their own exercise performance, and they agreed to undergo CAC scanning. And I want to be fair here um, to Evan's point that these patients did, their exercise history was assessed retrospectively, but they were stratified into three broad categories. So they either reached less than 1,000 met minutes per week, 1,000 to 2,000, greater than 2,000 estimated met minutes per week. What you can see here is that the athletes in the highest exercise category, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but people that exercise greater than 2,000 met minutes per week had significantly higher CAC scores and calcific plaque burden than participants with less exercise. Now, I am by no means concluding or, or saying that patients are our patients that we take care of that are mostly sedentary, and we know CAC is associated with adverse cardiovascular events, apply here. This is just an example of not all calcium is created equal, and we should be very careful how we apply broad stroke guidelines to these patients. And so I'm finished so that I can allow my opponent to go on, but you know, it, it, my takeaway from the past three weeks of, of delving in the literature has been that there really has been a disenchantment with risk calculators. And some of this has led for the very loud advocacy for coronary artery, artery calcium screening or the thought that if we know more, we see more and we can do more. But ultimately, the proper place for, for these, the, the rupture of these imaging findings is that they're tools. And in our toolbox, they should be used as risk clarifiers, risk supplementers. And in inappropriate sub subjects, it is... CAC is simple, it's not invasive, low radiation measurement of coronary artery calcium. And so it may help you assist your patient's risk. And so, you know, I just want to leave you with the sentiment that I that I, I think I carry and I hope I carry in all of my, my clinical encounters is that guidelines, trials, expert recommendations are meant to define practices that meet the needs of patients in most circumstances but they're not and should never be a replacement for clinical judgment. This is truly the high intensity matter that matters the most. It's been truly a privilege to speak with all of you this morning and I, and I give my floor to my, my dear friend and colleague, Evan. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, that was you know, a very insightful review and um, I'm really excited to hear what Evan has to say. So again, just to kind of summarize where we're at, um, you know, with patients who, who present like this, who have a low ASCVD uh, risk score and have incidental findings of low-grade atherosclerosis, do we treat those patients as primary prevention, as you're arguing, because they've never had any cardiovascular events, or do we consider those secondary prevention patients because we do see some degree of atherosclerosis. So you've argued these are primary prevention patients and should be subjected to the primary prevention guidelines, realizing that guidelines are not a substitute for clinical judgment as, as you so eloquently stated. And so now um, we're going to hear from Evan about uh, the argument that these patients should be considered secondary prevention patients. So before he starts, I, I'd like to introduce him. So Dr. Evangelos Ikonomu is a clinical fellow in cardiovascular medicine and a member of the ABIM Physician Scientist Research Pathway at Yale School of Medicine. He holds a medical degree from the University of Athens and a PhD in medical sciences from the University of Oxford. As a PhD student at Oxford, he investigated the biological interplay between the perivascular adipose tissue and human vasculature, developing and validating a machine learning approach to better characterize the role of perivascular inflammation in, in atherosclerosis. As a physician scientist at Yale and a member of the Cardiovascular Data Science or CARDS lab led by Dr. Rowan Kara, Evangelos is interested in applying multimodal machine learning approaches to personalize the diagnosis and treatment of cardiovascular disease. His most recent work has focused on the use of phenomapping strategies to derive personalized effect estimates from randomized controlled trials, as well as on the deep learning phenotyping of echocardiograms for early disease diagnosis. His work has been published in several peer reviewed journals, including Lancet, European Heart Journal, JAK, CIRC, and JAMA Cardiology. Evan, take it away. 
Thank you so much for the kind introduction, um, Dr. Hall. Um, and thanks so much, Jackie, for this wonderful presentation. And I have the difficult job of actually countering all those arguments that you just made and arguing that patients with asymptomatic coronary atherosclerosis in the modern era of non-invasive imaging should be actually treated in the context of secondary prevention. These are my disclosures. Now, I'm gonna start sort of from the end, and I'm gonna start by actually outlining the three key points that I will try to make in my effort to convince you that these are secondary prevention patients. My first point is that in the era of high sensitivity, non-invasive cardiac testing, the distinction between primary and secondary prevention in the traditional sense and use of those terms is antiquated and actually often used in a misleading way to justify therapeutic inertia. The second point is that we normally order cardiac tests to diagnose the patient's actual symptoms. So we interpret those tests cross-sectionally, sort of looking for ischemia as a cause of those patient's symptoms. But the fact is that when it comes to predicting those patients' long-term cardiovascular risk, there are other things such as the total plaque burden that are the major determinants of their long-term cardiac risk. And the third and the most important point is that the risk that is associated with subclinical atherosclerosis is modifiable, it's substantial, and therefore requires the timely initiation of risk-modifying therapy so that we can deliver the best outcomes for our, for our patients. Now, let's start with the first point. And this is a point about semantics and definitions. And I think that matters because language matters and how we talk about our patient's disease defines what our patients hear and what they think of their condition. Now, we all agree that coronary atherosclerosis is a progressive disease. Unfortunately, it starts at a young age. We have early onset of endothelial dysfunction and then through a range of maladaptive responses, as Jackie mentioned, through the contribution of inflammation, oxidative stress, we may have the formation of an atherosclerotic plaque that may eventually develop a high-risk phenotype in the form of a thin cap uh, fibrotheroma or a large lipid necrotic core that places this plaque at increased risk of rupturing or eroding but clinically, it's not until a patient develops a major adverse card cardiovascular event, a heart attack, that we start talking about secondary prevention. And therefore, in our daily pra practice, we, we, we ignore this whole continuum, this whole process that has proceeded over the, the previous like 20 or 30 years until the patient had this event. Uh, and we don't really talk about secondary prevention until that very point when that plaque ruptures and the patient comes into the ED with a heart attack. Therefore, the question becomes, how do we draw the line between primary and secondary prevention? Because if we open any medical textbook, that's not the definition of secondary prevention. Secondary prevention means instituting early therapies to prevent the progression of subclinical disease. Whereas everything we do, anything we do after a patient has a heart attack or a stroke is actually tertiary prevention. We're trying to minimize the disability uh, from, from that event. But when was the last time we ever we spoke about tertiary prevention in our in, in our cardiovascular clinics? So the question is, where do we draw, the, draw this line between primary and secondary prevention? And the way I think about it is uh, sort of odd. So I sort of borrow uh, this thought experiment from the world of physics. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concept of Schrodinger's cat. So this is uh, a thought experiment meant to describe why light may function both as a particle and a wave. Essentially, the thought experiment was that if we uh, there's a cat in a box, the box is closed and the cat is there with a flask of poison. Until we open the box, we don't know whether the cat is alive or dead. The cat could be both alive and dead, so it has two states. But when we open the box, then we can see whether the cat is actually moving or it's actually drunk the poison and it's dead. And that's how I think about our patients in our, in our primary prevention clinic. Um, we have a patient in front of us, but we have, unless we have any imaging of their coronary vasculature or their cardiac anatomy, we don't really know what's going on. And therefore, we can estimate some different, uh, their risk of having coronary disease by using different equations, such as the full cohort equations or the Framingham risk score. And as Jackie said, and I agree on that point, these are grossly miscalibrated and offer underestimate or overestimate risk in, across different racial and ethnic populations. But once we have any kind of imaging for a patient that we have in front of us, and specifically when we see any evidence of coronary calcium, then we can no longer claim ignorance. We've opened the box and we've looked inside and we know whether the cat is alive or dead. We know that a patient has evidence of coronary disease. And when we see any evidence of coronary calcifications, we can no longer claim that this is a primary prevention patient. 
this patient already has evidence of coronary disease, and we, sh we should start talking about secondary prevention. This brings me to the second point, that is that when we order cardiac testing, we mostly order that to diagnose uh, the cross-sectional symptoms that our patients present in clinic with. So a patient presents with chest pain or shortness of breath, the question is, are those symptoms anginal in nature? Are they driven by the presence of obstructive disease? Are they, are they driven by the presence of ischemia? But that's not the most important information that we have in uh, the most important tool we have to actually predict their long-term risk. It's actually their plaque burden that we should be looking after. And we've known this for a while. These are old data, and we've known for a while that patients develop coronary atherosclerosis over a long period of time. But it's not until the very late stages of that process that patients present with obstructive coronary disease. And that is because our coronary vessels, while they build up cholesterol, uh, fat, foam cells, and uh, inflammatory cells in their intima and subintimal layers, uh, neointimal layers, uh, they do undergo a process of positive remodeling, so they expand outwards in such a way that they maintain a minimal luminal diameter until they can no longer do that and we develop obstructive coronary disease. Throughout this process, and even though there may not be obstructive coronary disease, our vessels are exposed to a pro-inflammatory and prothyrogenic environment, and this increasing cholesterol and, and, and plaque burden places those, those patients at increased risk of developing a major event, a heart attack uh, through plaque erosion or plaque rupture. And we've known that up to 50% of all heart attacks actually originate from lesions and plaques that were previously angiographically uh, mild or at least moderate. Now, obviously it doesn't make sense to refer all our patients for cor invasive coronary angiography, but we do have excellent ways to non-invasively identify our patient's plaque burden. And as Jackie pointed out, and I agree, coronary calcium is a great way to do that. Now, coronary calcium is pathognomonic of coronary atherosclerosis. Once we see a spot, a, a voxel of high attenuation uh, uh, like plaque in the coronaries, we can no longer say that this patient does not have coronary disease. This is as pathognomonic as it goes. And the more plaque burden a patient develops, the greater the, the, the coronary calcium burden will become. And this will confer an increased risk of cardiovascular events, as Jackie also pointed out. Now, one of the key issues I would like to point out is that actually when we look across the population, and these are data based on a 20, more than 20,000 patient registry from Denmark, of symptomatic patients referred for coronary CT angiography. When we look at the data and we stratify the risk of our patients based on the, the extent of coronary atherosclerosis as, a, as, as determined by the extent of their calcium, calcium, uh, calcium burden. From now on, whenever I talk about calcium, I want you to think about plaque. Calcium equals plaque. There's actually no difference for the same level of coronary calcium burden uh, in, in terms of the patient's cardiovascular risk based on whether the patient has obstructive or non-obstructive coronary disease. So what those investigators showed is that actually cor the coronary calcium burden is a very good surrogate marker of the patient's um, long-term cardiovascular risk. And when we stratify our patients, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, across different levels of cor coronary artery calcium score burden, actually the presence or absence of obstructive coronary disease is not consistently associated with a higher risk. Now, patients with obstructive coronary disease, I'm, I, I'm, I won't argue that they don't have a higher risk. They for sure have a higher risk. But what I'm arguing is that that higher risk is actually mediated. It's mediated by the fact that those patients are also the ones that have a higher plaque burden. And it's the higher plaque burden that we should be going after and we should be using to modify our risk calculations. Now, this is also in agreement with our most recent uh, data uh, from the ischemia trial. And as you can see here, uh, what we, uh, uh, these, are these, are, these are actually recent analysis from, from, from post hoc analysis from the ischemia trial, where when we stratify patients based on the presence or absence of ischemia, as well as the extent of ischemia, there's no consistent association with the risk of all-cause mortality or the risk of, 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 of the primary endpoint of the trial but it's actually the presence and extent of anatomical disease of their plaque burden that is associated with a long-term cardiovascular risk. Both the risk of all-cause mortality, which is the most unbiased endpoint, as well as the primary endpoint of major adverse cardiovascular events that the ischemia inve investigators chose. Now, I'm not saying that everyone should be undergoing a coronary artery calcium score, 
Uh, but what I'm claiming is that we have plenty of opportunities to actually obtain that information in our everyday practice. And we've all been there. We've all referred our patients uh, for a, a, a myocardial perfusion imaging test. And as a bonus, we've had a CT done for attenuation correction. And uh, we do report the coronary calcifications there. And a lot of us integrate that in how we think about our patient's risk. And this is actually an interesting study uh, where Dr. Feher and Dr. Miller actually contributed where they showed that we can actually automate the extraction of that information from the CT scans that are done for attenuation correction and actually obtain a meaningful score, a meaningful, a meaningful coronary artery calcium score uh, for those patients uh, that correlates pretty well with the long-term cardiovascular risk uh, to the same level as the one obtained by expert readers. But we don't even need like a dedicated, uh, dedicated um, cardiac uh, test for that. How often do we see a patient in our, in our clinic or a patient in the ED that comes in with an acute coronary syndrome and we go through the chart and then we see that at some point, either in the context of diagnosing a, a pneumonia or like a ruling out PE or, or, or screening for lung cancer, they had some cross-sectional imaging of their chest at some point, five, 10 years ago, and they had coronary calcium there that was reported in the radiology report, but that was obviously not the focus at the time. So that, that was never acted upon. That was never integrated in a cardiovascular risk assessment. And we know that we know that even non-gated, thick slice, just CT scans can actually obtain meaningful information about the extent, the presence and the extent of coronary atherosclerotic burden through the form of coronary calcium. And we know that this correlates pretty well with the dedicated CAC score scans that we can get. And that correlates with their long-term cardiovascular risk. Perhaps the most granular way to obtain that information nowadays is through a cor dedicated coronary CT angiogram, the use of which has been constantly expanding. And we know that coronary CTAs can obtain uh, a, a lot of like uh, information, both in terms of the uh, presence of anatomical stenosis, so what's the, the, luminal, uh, the degree of luminal stenosis, as well as the plaque burden. We can quantify the low attenuation plaque. We can quantify the non-calcified, the calcified component of the plaque. And we know that all those things matter because they do determine and re-stratify what's going to happen to our patients three, five, ten years down the line. CDA can also provide a lot more information than that. Uh, so Jackie, I, I agree with what she, the point she made in the end. She pointed, uh, she pointed out not, that not every plaque is the same, and I, I absolutely agree with that. Coronary CTA though can offer information there. We can look for high-risk plaque features. We can look for like uh, spotty calcifications. It doesn't have to be a lot of calcium. Spotty calcium, if anything, identifies a higher risk plaque that, than, 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 than one that has dense calcium. Uh, and we can also look for things like mixed plaque, low attenuation plaque, such as the one our patient had. And even though it may not be angiographically severe, this is a plaque that is at high risk of rupturing, and I agree with Jackie. And I may be a bit biased here. We have done some prior work in this space uh, in my prior lab in Oxford. And what we looked at is other markers beyond the coronary wall, such as the periadventitial uh, peri peri fat, where we can actually capture meaningful information about early stages of coronary atherosclerosis and coronary inflammation that may not have translated yet into angiographically severe coronary disease. And we know that those things can further stratify the risk of our patients. The point I'm trying to make in this uh, second chapter of my presentation is that essentially every test, every cardiac test fulfills two purposes. First of all, it's a diagnostic test. It's meant to diagnose ischemia, diagnose the presence of obstructive coronary disease, say, tell our patients so that we can tell our patients that your symptoms are cardiac in nature and we should uptitrate your beta blocker, we should uptitrate your nitrates, we should consider your vascularization if those things don't work. But every test is also a wonderful opportunity to change our patients' risk uh, trajectory and what's going to happen to them down the line. And we can obtain meaningful information in the, in, the, in, in the presence of plaque burden and any form of coronary calcium to actually institute the therapies that are going to modify their outcomes. And this brings me to the last and the most important point of my talk, which is that the risk associated with sub subclinical atherosclerosis is modifiable, it's substantial, and needs to be addressed. And Jackie did a wonderful job of reviewing the literature on the use of aspirin in the setting of primary prevention, and, you know, I absolutely agree with everything she said. We should not be using aspirin in, in a primary prevention the way it was studied in those trials. And I agree that those are wonderful trials designed by amazing teams running, like, you know, many thousands of patients. And we know that aspirin does not confer a net clinical benefit 
when using the setting of those three patient populations that were studied in those three respective trials. But this brings me back to the fundamental issue about how we define primary prevention. And under this umbrella of primary prevention, we classify patients that are very heterogeneous in nature. And we classify patients like this one that has no evidence of coronary atherosclerosis under the same umbrella as patients like two or patient three that may not have symptoms, but still present in our primary prevention clinics. Now, once we have any sort of imaging for those patients, and again, it doesn't have to be a cardiac CT scan. It could be uh, a, a chest CT that was done for some other reason, but we have the information available. We can no longer claim ignorance. We can no longer claim that these patients should be interpreted and treated in the same way like patient two. And this brings me to uh, the point about what are the therapies that we can and should be using in this group. And these are data on the use of aspirin uh, in, in, this, in, this, in, in a patient population stratified based on the presence of coronary calcifications. And these are data from the study that actually Jackie pointed out. So the MISA study, 6,000 patients undergoing uh, CT scanning uh, to detect coronary calcifications. When we stratify those patients based on their baseline ACVD risk here, uh, what you can see is the, the, bar, the bars actually denote the number needed to treat to prevent a single MACE event. And when we look at a low risk population, we can see that for sure the orange bar are patients without coronary calcium. The number needed to treat is 2,700 and the number needed to harm obviously estimated here is 700. So there's no question here. We should not be using aspirin in those patients. But there's an inflection point here. The moment a patient's coronary calcium is no longer zero, their number needed to treat is lower than their number needed to harm. And it's for higher risk patients, uh, it may actually be pretty similar, but this is actually confounded by, those, by the fact that patients that have a higher ACVD score are, are also patients that are older, and therefore their number needed to harm is like pushed lower here. But for a patient like the patient we had, a patient with low ACVD, low bleeding risk, we can actually, based on the best data we have, claim that the number needed to treat is probably lower than the number needed to harm with aspirin. And we know that aspirin, for everyone who has staffed the patient at the VA with Dr. Fao, we know that aspirin may not be the best, you know, the best way to treat patients even in our, you know, in, in, in our secondary prevention and that, you know, Plavix and we know that DOACs uh, are maybe better, which is why we start dropping aspirin in those, in, 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 in those patients. And there's a lot of trials out there showing that. There's also a trial like the COMPASS trial, not applicable to our patient population because it's mostly applicable to what we still call a secondary prevention population, where we see that there's a net benefit uh, with rivaroxaban compared to aspirin in this patient population. But actually the MISA investigators have looked into that and they've actually modeled what would happen to the MISA population if they, if they were allocated to rivaroxaban versus, uh, versus um, uh, other therapies. And we can see that the moment a patient's coronary calcium is no longer zero, we can see that the number needed to treat, this is the orange bar here, is actually lower than the number needed to harm. They're, they're similar when their calcium score is zero, so there's probably not a clinical benefit, but the inflection point is again here, it's zero to one. It's not 100 to 100, it's not 300 to like 400, it's zero to one. And actually that may not apply necessarily just to uh, aspirin or uh, rivaroxaban. That may also apply to the use of statin therapies. And these are observational data from uh, 13,000 patients without pre-existing disease that underwent CAC scoring uh, that was done at Walter Reed. And the investigators actually applied inverse probability weighting to account for potential confounders. And what they found was actually there's no, associate, there's no benefit associated with the use of statins for patients uh, with a calcium score of zero, or at least no observed benefit in this study. But actually there's a substantial benefit that is observed. There's a significant association with a lower incidence of MACE events among patients that have any evidence of coronary calcifications when they're assigned to statin therapies versus not. And should we be interpreting LDL le levels differently based on the presence or absence of coronary calcium? Well, I'm not sure about that, but like there's, there's actually pretty compelling data out there. And this is a very well-designed study from Western Denmark, 23,000 patients undergoing coronary CTA. And as expected, we can see that higher LDL levels actually correspond to a higher risk of MACE. But when we stratify 
that 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 association based on the presence or absence of any degree of coronary calcification we can see that the association is significantly attenuated among patients without any evidence of coronary calcifications but it's pretty more substantial and the association is much stronger among patients that have any evidence of coronary calcifications and i'm not arguing that we should not be treating high cholesterol in patients without coronary calcifications but it does point towards a, a direction where oh, everything we do should actually be in, better interpreted in the context or, uh, of presence or absence of coronary calcifications. And I think this also raises another point about how images can be powerful, a powerful tool in advocating for our patients and actually engaging them in their care. How often do we invite our patients to actually look at their scans and have a patient that has no symptoms and we show them the, the, a, a scan of their heart and we show a normal scan on the left hand side and what a, a scan on the right hand side with some mild coronary calcifications uh, looks like in the LAD and say that this is not normal, this is pathognomonic of coronary disease, you're building out plaque, you may not be having symptoms, but that's not the same long term risk as this scan. And we should do our best to actually inform you about the risks of that and actually inform you about the things that we could potentially do to mo modify your trajectory and the risk of something of a major event happening down the line. And actually, we know patients respond to that. Patients are more likely to change their, their, their habits, start exercising, uh, change their diet, and they're much more likely to adhere to their prescribed therapies. And actually, as I was getting ready for the study this, uh, to, for the presentation this morning, I came across this study that was just published this morning in circulation. And what these investigators did was they randomized patients that had random evidence of coronary calcifications on a non-gated chest CT. These are patients that did not get a cardiac test, but did have evidence of coronary calcifications. They randomized them to actually notifying, notifying them about it or not notifying them about it for six months. And we see that patients that actually received a notification were much more likely to be prescribed statin therapy. And I think based on the results of the poll, we can all agree that statin therapy should be, should, be, uh, should be prescribed in this case. So, you know, this is a powerful tool that we should actually be uh, incorporating in our practice. And there's a wonderful editorial uh, that is uh, um, associated with this article today. So I'll invite you to read that if you're more interested. Now, I know what you're all thinking. You're all thinking that these are, uh, these are observational data. Um, and I, I, I'm just going to jump to the end, but uh, um, because I know I'm running out of time. But uh, I just wanted to point out that we do have randomized controlled clinical trial data, and I think this come in the form of the Scott Hart trial, where patients were randomized to coronary CTA versus standard care, and we see that patients that got an anatomical assessment of their coronary disease did better, and that's not because of any other reason other than that these patients got the therapies they needed. They got more asthma. They got more statins. And until they got those therapies, there was no difference. But once those therapies were started, then there was the, the two curves started to, uh, to uh, dissociate. And with that, I would like to come back to our, uh, our, our patient uh, and open up this for, for discussion. I think it, uh, it's, it's pretty obvious at this point that I would claim that this patient should be treated with aspirin. And if they're at low bleeding risk and they, don't, and, and, and they are really worried about their risk of having a heart attack, I would also advocate for the use of aspirin therapy. Um, so thank you all for your attention, uh, and uh, thank you, Jackie, for uh, for this uh, wonderful presentation that preceded. Um, and I would like to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Evan, for that wonderful talk. Um, I I have some thoughts and comments, but I want to sort of hold that off and invite um, anyone in the audience with any questions. Please feel free to raise your hand. Um, with using the hand raise function or enter questions into the chat. Um, we have an, a great comment by uh, Brian Malmo I'm going to read uh, while we're waiting. Uh, great presentations by both. I agree that patients with subclinical CAD as detected as on CTA CAC should not be treated as primary prevention as they have the disease, not just risk factors. Perhaps we need a new CAD classification similar to CHF stages. This would be stage B CAD. Um, uh, Rohan, you had a question. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Jackie and Evan, for uh, you know taking the time this morning. It was uh, excellent. Both of the both sides uh, are very convincing. So it's I think uh, nothing moves. I guess that's the end of uh, discussions. But uh, my my big question, uh, kind of maybe, is to both of you. How does how do you so all the discussions we had so far is an individual in which you kind of incidentally chanced upon finding uh, atherosclerosis. How do you balance that with the fact that, you know, our healthcare system is challenging for many patients? Uh, 
especially for marginalized communities who do not often get the tests that would help define these incidental diagnoses. And I think, you know, I, I would want each of you to sort of like, if possible, just say a little bit about how does that correlate? To, how does fairness play into deciding therapeutic choices? Great question. Greg, do you want to go first? No, please, you, you go first. I, I already won, so I don't want to go on. Mm -hmm. Um, so and, uh, this is this is an excellent point, right? Uh, because disparities may arise at any point of of the patient's care, uh, whether that's like diagnostic testing, whether it's how we respond to the diagnostic testing, and how uh, what therapies we chose to use. Um, the point I, I was trying to make is that there's plenty of opportunities to actually intervene, and I'm not saying that oh, everyone should be. Get, I never, I think I never, I, I, at no point did I claim that patients should get a calcium score, you know. I, what I pointed out is that as part of our ex existing practice, patients routinely get the information that would give us a calcium, like the, the presence of coronary calcium, but we don't systematically integrate that information uh, into our practice. And uh, the therapies that I, 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 I pointed out, aspirins and statins are, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, low risk therapies, uh, low cost therapies, sorry, um, that are are available. I do not, I, I do not, to, to patients that hopefully that would, would need them. I, I did not go into PCSK9 inhibitors. I did not go into SGLT2 inhibitors. So uh, my hope is that we can maximize the information we're already getting rather than uh, overburden uh, our system and our patients with more testing, but rather like maximize information from the tests that we are already obtaining and ordering. Yeah, Rohan, I'm not sure that that was your question. So you weren't getting at the cost of treatment. I think what you were getting at is the population, our, our most vulnerable populations are not getting these tests, these CACs and this coronary CTAs. And it, I think that's what you were getting at. And that's why I think for me, um, for me, I continue to use, and perhaps it's antiquated according to Evan's definition of primary or secondary, but I continue to have to rely on what we know in the data. We know diabetes is a risk factor. I know CKD is a risk factor. I know my black and brown patients are, they're, they're, they're being alive as a risk factor. And so I treat them in that manner. So for me, you know, this idea that if they have subclinical atherosclerosis, well, now I'm going to be aggressive. I'm going to be aggressive to begin with because I'm not going to be in the ivory tower where I will have access to these. So as a cardiologist, my job is to be aggressive based on what we really know from randomized control trials. Not what we know from observational data, not what we know from, you know, the rich, the rich ivory tower, but what we know about risk in our most at risk populations. And that's how we treat them. Um, because you're right, like how many of my patients in St. Louis had a CAC? Never. How many of my patients in St. Louis had a coronary CTA? Never. And so I, I, I take care of patients with the risks that I know are there. Great. No, thank you. Uh, I'll pass it on to uh, Erica. Great. Uh, this is a terrific talk and highlights um, exactly the difficult situation that we're in because we lack clinical outcomes data. And yet we know that the current risk tools that we have are insufficient. So my question to you both is, do you think that there is enough clinical equipoise for a prospective randomized controlled trial to test statin and or aspirin therapy in an at-risk population based on imaging findings who don't otherwise qualify for these therapies? I, th I think that's one point we can both agree on, <laughs> that we need more data. Um, and uh, that I, I think that, uh, and I, I, one of the points that Jack Drake uh, also made um, is that I think guidelines sort of lag behind practice, clinical practice, right? Uh, guidelines reflect studies that were published probably five or 10 years before the, tri the, the, the guidelines uh, came out. And those studies were done with patients that were enrolled five or 10 years before the study was published. So by definition, unfortunately, guidelines lag behind clinical care, uh, which is also why I think we should not, you know, it's it, this is a tricky point here because we should not be practicing outside guidelines. But as Jackie said, we should be using our, 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 our best knowledge and our best data and our best clinical judgment to inform care. But I do agree that control trials are the, you know, the way to 
generate that evidence and we can all agree on that and that's not out there yet mostly because we don't know how to we don't agree on the definitions obviously <laughs> I agree with Evan. I think, you know, it surprised me, actually, given that he's my esteemed outcomes expert colleague, that he used a lot of non-outcomes data points. But regardless, I agree that there is enough equipoise um, to, to go ahead and, and, and begin to perform these, study, these studies. But I think to Rohan's point, which I think was the most powerful point that I'm sorry I didn't make, is that, sure, we go ahead and we do another randomized control trial, like we did for PCSK9 inhibitors. In Connecticut, I can barely get my patients on PCSK9 inhibitors. So it's sort of like we can continue to have data and continue to have these discussions, which are, are, are fun, honestly, but how much of it is actually getting to the patients that need it the most? Um, so sure, let, let's go ahead and do another randomized control trial, but when will it reach everyone that actually needs it? That's and I think a, that's... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please. No, I'm I'm going to launch into like a, a separate point from that. So so please respond to it, a, a related point. But go ahead. No, no, no. You, uh, I was just going to say that I, I think it's all about like still it's all about like individualized decision making, right? Like our job is to actually present the best data we have to our patients and say that you know here's the data. And obviously there's well, there's no right or wrong answer necessarily. But like depending on what's most important for you, like if you're really concerned about your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke then these are the data and maybe what's a number needed to treat that is on like the same as a number needed to harm for a bleeding event uh, that would make a patient another patient not want to go on aspirin for you that may be the right way to go because that's what imp what's important for you yeah that was actually a perfect dovetail in, into exactly the point i wanted to make which is to say for me i, I think there's sort of two key takeaways from this one of which is that you know, in, in the absence of clearer data, I think the role of shared decision-making, which is exactly what you just described, is absolutely crucial here. You know, in someone who's had cardiovascular events, it's it's kind of malpractice not to, to strongly recommend aspirin and high-intensity statin unless there's a really compelling contraindication. But in patients like this, you know, I, I, think, to, I, I think to your point, Evan, we, we can't really say it's prime, full primary prevention if we've seen some degree of coronary atherosclerosis. But to Jackie's point, mo a lot of the secondary prevention data is saying is based on the definition of secondary prevention as someone who's had an event. And so these patients do sort of fall into this prevention 1.5 category, hence our title. And so, you know, the 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 grayer the 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 zone is, I think the the all the more important the role is of shared decision making, realizing that of course we have to respect autonomy and, and patients have the right to make bad decisions that go against their own interests. And we just have the obligation to counsel them accordingly. But in these cases, I think interrogating patient goals and values are very important, which is to say for some patients, they're very worried about their risk of events and they want to do absolutely everything possible. And when, you know, we give them this information, they say, yeah, you know, I, I would like to take these medications. Other patients feel very burdened by taking medications. That's very distressing to them. And, you know, the, and also sometimes it can be a nice, as you pointed out, Evan, that when they have this data, that can be very motivating for them to actually undertake lifestyle interventions that have excellent data showing uh, better outcomes. And so, you know, it, it may be an impetus to live a healthier lifestyle, which not only has cardiovascular disease prevention benefits, but typically um, a lot of the heart healthy lifestyle behaviors also um, have effects across other organ systems, you know, for example, cancer prevention um, in, in, by eating a predominantly whole food plant based diet and avoiding smoking. Um, and so, so there are a lot of benefits to be had there. And then that sort of veers back again to Jackie's point, which, which is looking at our larger population. I think some of the reason this is so difficult for us is because in the Western world where atherosclerosis is so incredibly common because of our unhealthy lifestyle, it's, I, I think we almost have a cognitive bias to, to treat some small degree of coronary calcification as almost normal aging, just like we think of hypertension as almost normal, a normal aging phenotype. Um, and in fact, that's not, that's not normal aging, that's pathologic aging in an in industrialized society that for for which the default lifestyle is a not heart healthy lifestyle and actually systemic level changes that make the default practices more in line with what we know about promote what promotes a heart healthy lifestyle 
actually does stand to provide benefits, not just to the individual patients that we're imaging, but also uh, to populations. And so I, I think taking that into account is also really critical. And, and, I, and I think for, it's, it's easier to sort of not get excited by, by imaging findings when it's so pervasive, but I think we need to be a little bit less complacent about the fact that, oh, that's just, you know, that's just what happens when you age because that's a society that we live in. And um, I, I think maybe we, we shouldn't accept that as, as readily as, as we may have in the past. So um, I, I know well, we're out of time. I, can I just hear Dr. Furman had, had a yes. point? Like, yes. And, and, I, and I understand people may have to go, but I do want to hear that. So sorry about that. Go ahead, Margaret. No, I just wanted to bring up one thing about the limitations of our risk scores. Um, and, you know, when you're also considering the patients, why I agree, they're very helpful and I use them all the time in practice. You know, there are things that we consider traditional or non-traditional risk factors that aren't included, such as family history, which can be varied um, depending on the lipid panel. You know, there were recent studies that came out you know, honing in on the fact that too high of an HDL is an individual risk, even suggesting those in women greater than 80 and 70 in men, where traditionally we always thought it was just at least over 100. Um, and then just obviously my area, the autoimmune disease patients, you know, that have higher risk, those aren't taken in when, um, you know, in these traditional risk scores, plus if patients are in active inflammation, their lipid panels could be suppressed. And so you're underestimating their risk. You know, I agree with Sarah a lot. This is a conversation you need to have with the patients. And our role a lot is you need to educate them what we know, you know, why you're recommending treatment, but it's a joint decision between the patient and the physician. And then the other side is, I think we also need to do a good job educating, um, not just you know cardiology, our field where we're all having this great conversation, but as well as the internists so that there aren't mixed messages where, oh, you don't need to treat, you're young, give your chance a lifestyle, you know, where we're saying actually your risk is a little bit higher. But overall, I wanted to say great job, you guys. And I think this conversation should be continued. Thank you so much. That's a, I, I, I could not have wrapped this up better. And um, thank you so much, uh, Jackie and Evan for those wonderful presentations. I, I think these discussions do need to continue. And I, I think there's a lot of food for thought and I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance and their attention. Uh, stay safe out there today in the snow. Thank you.